Morning. Hello. I thought we could do with some Slayer to uh, get us in the mood today because, you know, it's week. Actually, I've lost count what week it is. Maybe 10, possibly. And, uh, you know, the, the, the forums are getting uh, busier. <laughs> People are seeming more um, on the edge. So uh, that's normally when Slayer is what you need to... Uh, I don't know, maybe take you over the edge, but maybe pull you back. Who knows? Um, but also, the tenuous link to the lecture is uh, that was a song about a serial killer called Ed Gein. And uh, he's, he's going to pop up a bit later on, on the screen. That kind of rhymed. So today, uh, we're going to carry on the Anover theme. Um, last week, we did Ankover, did we? I don't know, I'm losing track. Um, and this week we're moving on to, uh, to, to well, we're do, it's kind of variations on a theme. So uh, at some point I did say, you know, from now to the rest of term, it's, it's kind of all quite a similar territory. And I'm going to attempt to be true to that promise by just sort of doing more Anova, really. So it, 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 it should all work out good, hopefully. You never know. So what we're going to do today is have a look at what's known as a two-way Anova. And, uh, well, I'll explain what that is in a minute, but really it's... It's just, it, it, it's quite similar to the Anovas we've done before. We're just kind of moving on to look at when we have uh, more than one independent variable. Or if you want to put it another way, more than one categorical predictor. So we'll very, 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 very briefly look at uh, how this affects how we partition variants. But uh, blink and you'll miss that. Um, we're not going to do too much theory at all. We're mainly going to concentrate on the pragmatics of how this differs from other ANOVAs, look at uh, two examples, how you would interpret them, and that sort of thing. So there's going to be a lot on interactions. Now, we've already come across interactions when um, we did the lecture on moderation, which was in week something else. Um, it was just before your class test. So I think that was the lecture when there was about two people here. Uh, so those two people... Um, Think back to moderation, because uh, we're, we're continuing that theme. So what is a two-way independent ANOVA? Well, when you read journal articles, you'll, you'll see that ANOVA is used a lot, because uh, uh, in many, many situations, psychologists will be manipulating independent variables using different groups of people, or uh, as we'll come on to next week, subjecting the same people to different experimental conditions. So, so dealing with grouped data or, or sort of categorical predictors is pretty common. So when you read research articles, you'll quite often come across them saying, we did an ANOVA of some description. Now, the type of ANOVA that people do depends on the design of their study. So, so far, we've looked at where you only have one grouping variable. So you've manipulated one independent variable. And you know, we've, we've dealt particularly with the situation where you put different people into different levels of, of that independent variable. So uh, in our Viagra example, we had a libido group, a low-dose group, a high-dose group containing different people. So that would be known as a one-way ANOVA. And the one-way just refers to the fact that there's one independent variable. So, when you come across someone having done a two-way ANOVA, what that means is they've manipulated two independent variables. And you uh, might also come across uh, studies that have used three-way ANOVAs. And that's where they've manipulated three independent variables. So whenever you see an ANOVA described, or if you're trying to describe the ANOVA that you've done on your data, you need to use this sort of one-way, two-way, three-way description. And that just refers to the number of independent variables you've manipulated. Now, as you can imagine, uh, if you start manipulating more and more independent variables, the, the, the analysis gets quite complicated. So on this module, we only ever look at a three-way ANOVA. That's the last letter, like a, a Christmas present to you all, is uh, to look at a three-way ANOVA uh, in the very last lecture. And that's as far as we go. And the reason why we only go that far is because I think if, if you have more independent variables than three, your analysis starts to become completely uninterpretable. Which is not to say that people don't do it. And in fact, I have done, I've got papers where I've done four and five way ANOVAs. But in retrospect, they were stupid things to do. I shouldn't have done it. So um, there, there's a sort of, there's a pragmatic reason in that, you know, I think a three-way three -way ANOVA is a, about as complicated as you ought to be getting as a scientist. And if you're getting more complicated than that, it's going to be very difficult to actually work out what's going on. 
The other thing is you'll notice in descriptions of ANOVAs, people often refer to them as being, say, independent ANOVAs. Uh, sometimes people use the phrase between groups or between subjects as well. But basically, they're all the same thing as an independent ANOVA. So independent just means different participants were put into like different groups. So the variables, the independent variables were manipulated using different people to represent the different levels of those variables. So when you see uh, an independent ANOVA or a between group ANOVA or sometimes even a between subjects ANOVA, they all mean the same thing. It just means different people in different conditions. The other uh, term you'll sometimes, we'll come on to this next week, you'll sometimes hear ANOVAs referred to as repeated measures ANOVAs or within subject ANOVAs. And uh, that's where you've used the same participants uh, but tested them under different conditions. But that's, that's for next week. So at the moment, we're just going to deal with a two-way ANOVA and we're going to deal with an independent design. So this is where all of the various conditions that we have, uh, we've used different participants in each of those conditions. Now, when we've got more than one independent variable, uh, you'll sometimes hear it referred to as a factorial design. That's why the lecture is called factorial ANOVA. So that just means you have more than one independent variable. So when you, uh, I mean, this is all basically like years and years ago, uh, someone decided, like some BD statistician thought, you know, you know what? I've just, I've just invented the central limit theorem or something like that. I think statistics is getting a bit too easy for everyone to understand. What can I do to confuse them? I know I'll invent lots and lots of different ways of expressing exactly the same thing. So, you know, rather than calling something, you know, an independent design, let's make it acceptable to call it between group and between subject as well. So there's three different terms that mean exactly the same thing. And you see this sort of thing time and time again in statistics. Like, well, I've touched on it before, actually, with error and residual and things like that. You see sort of the different words referring to the same thing. A factorial design is, is one of those kind of things because... Sometimes independent variables bizarrely are referred to as factors. So that's why it's known as a factorial design. But this gets very confusing because next term you're going to learn about something called factor analysis. And the factors in factor analysis are completely different to the factors that we're going to talk about now, which are independent variables. So uh, it's, it's, it's a linguistic mess for us all. But you know, the, the touching and nice point to take from this is that it's confusing for all of us, uh, not, not just you. So why would we do a factorial design? Why would we make things more complicated? That's, you know, that's an insane thing to do. Surely we want to keep things simple. Stats is hard enough as it is. Why make life more difficult? Well, the main reason is because we can look at how our predictor variables, our independent variables, interact with each other. And this is a really, really powerful tool. And this goes back to this idea of moderation that we dealt with earlier on the course. So interactions between variables show up moderation effects. And what are moderation effects? That is where one independent variable has an impact on the effect of the other independent variable. So uh, these are uh, basically these moderation effects are more often than not more interesting than looking at the effect of a variable in isolation. So what do I mean by a moderation effect? Well, one very simple example uh, I teach two very different courses. I teach this course, uh, module, sorry, uh, and I teach uh, a third year option on anxiety in children, which is what I do research on. Very, very different topics, as you might imagine. And um, you might also imagine that, from my point of view, very, very different um, student kind of feedback. <laughs> because on my fear and anxiety course, you know, I could literally just sort of turf up and ramble on in a fairly bored way. And uh, everyone would say, oh, it's a really interesting course because talking about how anxiety develops in children is intrinsically a bit more interesting than heteroscedasticity, apparently. Uh, whereas on this course, uh, module, whatever they're called these days, um, you know, people come into it with the expectation that it's going to be very dull. So, you know, I feel like I need to make more of an effort. Um, so students have sort of different reactions to the courses. They sort of come into them already, uh, you know, expecting one to be boring and expecting the other one to be interesting. Uh, but the other thing is, students also, uh, you know, looking out, nine o'clock on a Monday, I actually have my third year option immediately after this. I've got a very direct comparison of, of what a group of students at nine o'clock in a stats lecture look like compared to a group of students in a, in a clinical psychology lecture. 
uh, at 10 o'clock on the same morning. And um, typically the, the 10 o'clock ones, they still look about as bleary-eyed as you do, to be perfectly honest, but um, they, they, they do look a bit less scared as a general rule. Um, but anyway, I might want to look at, say, you know, if you've been out drinking the night before, that's going to affect how sleepy you are in a lecture. So I might be interested in that effect. So is, you know, because I'm, I'm kind of a paranoid person. If people are sleeping during my lectures, uh, I, tell you, you know, I think I'm being dull. And I don't like the thought of being dull, which is slightly odd, given what I teach. But anyway, um, so I might want to test that. Is it the case that people sleep more when they're hungover than when they're not? So that's an effect I might be interested in. But... I might want to you know, take account of the type of thing that I'm teaching. So it might be the case, for example, that because stats is a naturally less interesting topic, that also has an effect on whether people sleep or not. Maybe people are more likely to be awake if I'm talking about how uh, anxiety develops than if I'm talking about moderation effects. So I might want to combine those into a single study. And it might be the case that, for example, the sleepiness of uh, you know, how sleepy you are is not particularly affected by how hungover you are unless you happen to be in a stats lecture. So that would be a moderation effect. So having a hangover doesn't affect your sleepiness in a clinical lecture. So in a clinical lecture, you're, you sleep about the same, or you know, in general, sleepiness levels are about the same. But in a stats lecture, there's a, suddenly a big difference. Like if you have a hangover, that's it. You know, the, the, the mention of skewness, just you're off, like narcoleptic fit. Um, so that would be an example of the moderation effect. Now I'm going to labour this point and go through a different example. So the other thing, um, I, I stumbled across, a, um, I'm always stumbling across papers that are not remotely related to what I do research on, but I stumbled across this, this paper about um, injuries from playing computer games. Uh, so here's, here's a little montage that I made of some console related injuries. <laughs> this is my favourite. Can you see where this one's going? <laughs> so, um, yes, playing computer games may well injure you or uh, your nearest and dearest. So we could put this to the test. We could uh, look at one independent variable, which was the type of console. So are you playing a Wii or are you playing an Xbox? Because uh, they, they have different ways of doing the motion. I, I'm a bit out of my depth here. I don't really do games, consoles, but they have different ways of doing the, the motion thing. So uh, from what I gather on a Wii, you have a little remote control thing that you can bash your children around the head with. Uh, whereas on an Xbox, it does some magic where you just go like that and it detects your movement. Um, so you could try different games, consoles, but you could also try you know, static games versus... You know, active games. There are some games, you know, where you're just sitting there shooting stuff, uh, or shooting stuff, or shooting stuff. I don't know what you do. Uh, but there'll be other games, you know, like the, uh, I assume he was skiing, the guy who trod on his dog when he was doing all that sort of thing. I don't really know. Um, so you could have a look at active games. So you've got two independent variables here. One is Xbox versus Wii, and the other one is a, a static game where you're not moving around doing stuff versus one of those kind of active games where you're, you're using the, the movement technology to uh, play tennis or, uh, or just beat up your children. So we could have a look at what are known as main effects. So this is the, the effect of an independent variable in isolation. So for example, this would be uh, uh, the main effect of playing a Wii versus playing an Xbox. So we've got the severity of injuries. That's our outcome variable. And we could have a look at, well, does it make a difference whether, you, whether you're playing Wii or Xbox? And actually, from, there's a bit of a difference here, but it's not much of a difference. So there's you know, kind of probably not too much of a difference in the injuries based on the console you use. 
What about the type of game? So a static game versus an active game. So uh, here we've got a bit more of a difference and the error bars are not overlapping, so that's probably significant. So we could say, well, there's a main effect overall. The injuries are worse, they're more severe in the active games, that's the, the dark blue bar over here, than in the static games, as you might expect. When people are moving around, they're more likely to, uh, to get injuries. But what we're interested in is again, this interaction or the moderation effect. So are there kind of differences in the effect that static versus active games have depending on which console you use? And that would be shown up when we look at all of the conditions sort of together. So, you know, we've got uh, here, we've got the static games and the light bar is the Wii and the, uh, I'll put a W on it if I can draw, uh, and the dark bar is Xbox. So in the static condition, so when they're playing static games, games where they're not moving around using their kinetic technology or whatever it's called, there's basically no difference between the two consoles. So it doesn't matter whether you're playing a Wii or an Xbox, the severity of the injuries that you sustain as a result of playing those games are pretty similar. However, in the active games, so when you're actually using these games where you're supposed to you know, dance or ski or bowl or throw your telly around, uh, there suddenly does become a difference between the two consoles. So again, we've got the Wii over here and the Xbox over here, and you get more injuries from the Wii. So when you have a, you know, a, a thing in your hand that you can throw across the room, uh, you, get, you get more injuries or more severe injuries than you do with the Xbox. So notice that in the active condition, both of those bars are higher than in the static condition. So for both the consoles, you get a bit of an increase in the severity of injuries for the active condition. But that's particularly pronounced for the Wii. So for the Wii, you, the, the bar is higher than the Xbox. So this is a, a classic moderation effect. In the static condition, no different. I mean, I've exaggerated it a bit. There's literally no difference uh, between Wiis and Xboxes. But in the active condition, you suddenly get a difference between uh, the two consoles. So the effect of the console is moderated by the type of game that you're playing. Or you could, you could actually, you could put it the other way around as well. So the, the effect of the type of game you're playing is moderated by the, the, the console. So that's what we're talking about with moderation. And that's really what this lecture is all about. So we're just going to go through uh, a couple more examples to sort of drum the point home. So to, to keep things close to the textbook and the handout, the first example that we'll go through is uh, about the beer goggles effect, which we talked about a bit um, in the lecture on writing up lab reports. So this is the idea that your, uh, well, your, your sort of standards for um, choosing dates are affected by alcohol. So the more you drink, the, you get the beer goggles on and you, you start losing all sense of uh, what's attractive and what's not. So we've got an independent variable here that represents the beer goggles effect, which is a dose of alcohol. So if you've had no alcohol versus, say, two pints of regular strength, something or other, vodka, uh, or four pints of regular strength, something or other. And if your outcome was you know, the attractiveness of the partner that you chose on that night, then that, that effect of alcohol is basically going to tell you the beer goggles effect. Now, what we might want to do is to, to say, well, is the beer goggles effect going to be different in men and women? That's, again, a moderation effect. So are males more or less susceptible to the beer goggles effect than females? So to test this, we'd have to also measure the gender of the participants. So we've got two independent variables, a dose of alcohol and the gender. As I said, our outcome variable would be some, you know, let's say we... we sort of dose them up, so we've got different groups, we give them different doses of alcohol. Obviously the males and females will be different groups, you're either a male or a female, so that's self-selecting. Um, and your outcome, at the end of the night, they all go off, pick a date, and then uh, in a slightly uh, hideous way, we, as they go out, we have a panel of judges to uh, judge the attractiveness of the mate that they've selected. Very ethical. So the data might look something like this. Now, it isn't important to sort of inwardly digest these data particularly, but just note that we've got six different groups representing all the combinations of our independent variables. So these females had, uh, there's oh, two forces. So there's eight females here who had no alcohol. There's a different eight females here who had two pints because it's an independent design. And a different group of females here who had four pints. 
And also, we then got three groups of males. So a group of males who had no pints, a group who had two pints, and a different group, again, who had four pints. And uh, these are the attractiveness ratings of the partners that they chose. So that's basically what we have. Uh, six different groups of people. For each person in the, in the study, we have one rating, which is a rating of the attractiveness of the mate that they selected. So what happens when we partition variance? Now I said I'd go over this briefly, and uh, I, I will. So when we do like a one-way ANOVA, or when we fit a, you know, a, regress, a linear model of any description, we've seen before that we'll have some kind of total variance. So that will be, in this case, the total variability in the attractiveness ratings. And we slice it into two. So one of those slices represents the variance in those ratings that's explained or accounted for by our experimental manipulation. Now in this case, we've got more than one experimental manipulation. So uh, the only difference in this diagram to ones before is I've put an S on the end there. So it's manipulations, not manipulation. The same principle, basically. We've got a chunk of variance that's explained by the things that we've done to the different groups. And we've got another chunk of variation over here which is the error. So that's just variation in attractiveness ratings that can't be accounted for by the variables that we've manipulated. So up to now, this is exactly the same as what we've seen before for any linear model that we've covered. That's the basic process. You've got variance accounted for by the model versus error. The only difference here is that this variance accounted for by the model gets partitioned up into an effect of your first independent variable, in this case, alcohol, an effect of the second independent variable, in this case, gender, and the effect of their combined effect, if you like, so their interaction. So we just, when we have sort of more than one independent variable, we just get our, our uh, sort of experimental variance, for want of a better word, get subdivided up into you know, different, different effects. So effect of one independent variable, the other, and the interaction. So it's really, it's no different to what we've been doing before. The only difference is, is rather than getting one effect, so when we've done ANOVAs before, whether it was in the context of regression or analysing different groups, uh, we've always had just one F ratio. But now we're going to get three. We're going to get an F ratio for the two effects of the independent variables and one F ratio also for the interaction. So that's the only difference to what we've done before. Is uh, just You can think about it like... Uh, we have every other linear model, we're just adding in new predictors. So when we, when we looked at moderation, we, we uh, you know, talked about adding in, sort of, uh, adding in new predictors, like in a multiple regression. We're just doing the same here. Rather than having one categorical predictor, we've got two categorical predictors and their interaction as a predictor as well. So it's, all, it's just it's exactly the same as what we've done before. We just get more Fs in our table. So when you do this in SPSS, you get a table like this, which looks a fair bit more hideous than uh, some of the tables that we've come across before. But it becomes less hideous if you do this and basically ignore the stuff that you don't actually need to pay any attention to. So there's three things in here, really, that we need to pay attention to, or three rows of the table. One of them shows our what's known as a main effect. So it's, it's the effect of gender on its own. The main effect of alcohol, that's the effect of alcohol on its own. <clears throat> and also the effect of the interaction. So everything else in the table we can pretty much ignore. This is the same as every other ANOVA table that you've come across on this module. So we've got an F ratio for each effect. And that F ratio is calculated by taking the mean square for the effect and dividing by the mean square error for the model. So the F is computed in exactly the same way. It represents exactly the same thing. It's the ratio of the effect to the error in the model. And that's true for all three of these. So you get an F for each one of them, and you get a P value for each one of them as well. So we're just looking whether those P values are less than 0.05. So in the case of gender, it's not less than 0.05, so that would be a non-significant effect. But for alcohol and for the interaction, those P values are less than 0.05. In fact, they're quite a lot less. They're very significant. So Basically, we've got no significant effect of gender, we've got a significant effect of alcohol, and a significant interaction. All of these effects have degrees of freedom associated with them, so if you're reporting the effect of gender, you'd want the one degree of freedom and the error degree of freedom. If you're reporting alcohol, 
you'd have the degree of freedom for alcohol, and again, the error degree of freedom. And if you're reporting the interaction, the degree of freedom for the interaction, and again, the error. So with all of them, you report the error degrees of freedom and the degree of freedom for the effect. So it's all very straightforward, very similar to what we've done before. Nothing particularly uh, new or, uh, or worrying or anything. So let's have a look at what these effects actually mean. So what does it mean to say there is a main effect of alcohol? So we got a significant effect of alcohol. What does that actually mean? Well, imagine that we had not measured gender at all. So we uh, just forget that information ever existed. So all we know is that we have a bunch of people who had no alcohol, a bunch who had uh, two pints, and a bunch who had four pints. So notice I've put them into boxes. And the scores in the boxes represent all the scores of anyone who had no alcohol. So this first column is actually men, and, or it might be the other way around, I can't remember. And the other column is women. But we don't know what they are, so we just imagine we don't know that, and we've just lumped them together in a group. So we've got all the people together who had no alcohol, irrespective of their gender, and put them in a box, put their scores in a box. Then we've done the same for people who had two pints, and the same for people who had four pints. And then we calculate the mean of those groups. So uh, people who had no pints, irrespective of their gender, the mean was six, well, just under 64. Uh, when they had two pints, it was just over 64. And after four pints, it was about 46 and a half. So the main effect of alcohol is like doing a one-way ANOVA on those three means. It's exactly the same. You ignore gender. And you just, what, effectively what's going on computationally is it's doing a one-way ANOVA to test whether those three means are different. So what you might find is, uh, well, we did find actually that they are different. So we can report that as being there's a significant main effect of the amount of alcohol consumed on the nightclub, uh, at the nightclub on the attractiveness of the mate selected. We report our F, our degrees of freedom, as uh, I just told you what they would be, and the p-value, which in this case because it's so small, we can report it as less than 0 0.001. What that tells us is these three means are, somewhere along the line, not equal to each other. So that significant effect means that you know, amongst those three means, there are some differences. We'd have to go and do some post-op tests or something to work out where those differences are. We just know they're different. So looking at a graph, it becomes reasonably obvious where the differences are. So we can see that the means for the no and two pint groups are pretty similar. There's not much of a change there at all. But there's a sudden sort of dramatic decrease in the means for four pints. So although we need to do some formal tests to demonstrate this, basically this main effect of alcohol is saying that when you ignore gender, the beer goggles effect kicks in at four pints. It doesn't kick in at two pints because two and zero pints are sort of the same. Uh, it kicks in at four pints. So at four pints, suddenly, your, the attractiveness of the person you select dips. What about the main effects of gender? Well, effectively, we're doing exactly the same thing. So we're pretending that we don't know how much alcohol people drunk, and we're just grouping them according to whether they're males or females. Now, this should be the point at which you start to realise why the interactions are more interesting than the main effects. Because at this point, when we're looking at the effect of gender, when we're looking at whether males differ from females, we've got some females here who had nothing to drink, we've got some who had two pints to drink, and we've got some who've got four pints to drink. So that group of, of females is, is not a sort of a very homogenous group. Some of them are shit-faced, and some of them are completely sober. And the same is true in the men. Some of them are, these, these guys are sober, these guys have had four pints. So... Although we can say you know, there's a main effect of gender or whatever, you've got to bear in mind that when we've lumped all the females together, those females are, uh, are, you know, have different levels of intoxication. And the same with the males. That male group is made up of uh, you know, differently intoxicated men. And although they'll sort of balance out in the sense that you know, you've got as many women who had four pints as you have men, it's still, you know, it's not really comparing gender on a, on a very even keel because... Uh, you know, there, there's a lot going on within that group. But nevertheless, if you wanted to interpret this main effect, basically the F ratio that you get is going to be testing whether those two means are different. And we saw that this wasn't a significant effect. So our p-value was equal to 0.161. That was non-significant. So what that means is that a mean of 60.21 
is uh, equal, or approximately, to a mean of 56.46. In other words, on average, the, rate, the uh, attractiveness of the mates selected by females was no, not really different to that of males. Again, you can see this very clearly on a graph. So the F is just telling us, are those two means different? You can see they're really, really, really similar. The error, error bars completely overlap. So nothing much going on there. Now, what about our interaction? This is the main thing that we're interested in. So how do we go about interpreting these? Well, essentially, you can do it in one of two ways. The first way is to say, what's the effect of gender at each level of alcohol? So we could here say, well... When they've had nothing to drink, what's the difference between men and women? So the, uh, I've been a bit gender stereotyped here in giving the males a blue line and the females a sort of pinky red line. Um, so what's going on in the, after, after no alcohol? Well, basically, the, the ratings of the male partners are slightly higher than those of the females, but not very much. They're basically sort of the same. The error bars are all overlapping. So there's not really a gender effect at no uh, at no pints. What about our two pints? Is there a gender effect there? Well, again, we get basically a very similar result. So the male and female, uh, or the attractiveness of the mates that males and females select, are basically kind of the same. They're, they're more or less equivalent. So at no pints and at two pints, there sort of isn't a gender effect. Now, what happens at four pints? Well, at four pints, suddenly we start to get an effect of gender because the, male, the, the, rate, the partners that the males pick, their attractiveness is much lower, so the blue line is, is much lower than the red line. So at four pints, you get this very sort of pronounced effect in males. There's a big dip in their, in their quality control, uh, but the females, there's not really an equivalent dip. So you can, this interaction, this significant interaction represents the fact that there kind of isn't a difference between men and women when they're sober. There isn't really a difference when they've had two pints. But when there's four pints, there is a big difference. So it's like the beer goggles effect kicks in for men at four pints, but doesn't for women. Now, the other way you can look at that is to look at the effect. So we've looked at the effect of gender, uh, gender at each level of alcohol. You can do the reverse. You can look at the effect of alcohol at each level of gender. So we could say, well, what's the effect of alcohol in the females? So what's the pattern in the red line? Well, the pattern in the red line is it's pretty flat. It doesn't really change too much, which suggests that the effect of alcohol in women is, is kind of no effect, really. They're, they're, the attractiveness of the partners they pick is relatively unaffected by alcohol. What's the effect of alcohol on men? Well, again, we get a very different pattern. So at low doses of alcohol, nothing much is going on, but you suddenly get this dip at four pints. So the effect of alcohol in men is different to the effect of alcohol in women. So it basically, it doesn't affect women, it does affect men. So that's what an interaction is, and, and that's how you, you need to try to sort of interpret these graphs. So we'd say there was a significant interaction between the amount of alcohol consumed and the gender of the person selecting a mate on the attractiveness of the partner selected. Again, report the F, degrees of freedom. And because the significance was, was like zero, we can report it as less than 0 0.001. Sometimes you'll see interactions expressed as bar charts rather than line charts, but the same basic principle applies. So here we've got uh, males as the light blue and females as the dark blue bars. So again, you can see not really a gender difference for no alcohol, not really, a, these are the same data, not really a difference uh, after two pints, but at four pints, you suddenly start to get a difference between the genders. I just wanted to put the bar chart up because uh, you know some, sometimes people do bar charts, sometimes they do line charts. You wouldn't ever do both, but just you will need to be able to interpret both because uh, you know you, you can do either. So you'll come across either when you read research papers. So what is an interaction? Well, just to simplify things, let's imagine that. Um, Let's imagine that we just had a scenario where there were no pints or four pints. So we've, we've got rid of the middle condition just to make things a bit easier. So what an interaction is testing, quite literally, is... So first of all, we have a look at the difference between men and women after no pints, and that difference turns out to be 6.25. So the uh, males 
I've, actually, I've, changed, I've swapped the colours around here, which is not a very sensible thing to do. So the males who are now the red line uh, have got higher, slightly higher uh, attractiveness ratings than the women. So that's the difference of 6.25. After four pints, if we look at the difference here, now notice the lines have crossed over. So now the male line is below the female line. So that's actually a difference of minus 21.8. Because they've switched over, when we do the subtraction, it ends up being a minus number. So I've plotted these two numbers here. So this, this number here is 6.25, and that number there is minus 21.8. The interaction is literally testing, is 6.25 different from minus 21.8? So are these two, two values down here different from each other? And if they are, then you know, you'll, you'll get a significant interaction. So it's literally testing, is, is, you know, is the difference between males and females at no alcohol different to the difference between males and females at four pints. Here's an example if we didn't have a significant interaction. So let's imagine for no pints we've got the same difference as before, so 6.25. But now notice the lines are parallel to each other. So after four pints, uh, nothing much has changed really. So we've got a difference between males and females of only 5.6. This would be a non-significant interaction because the difference between men and women at no pints is basically the same as the difference between men and women at four pints. Now, the important thing about this diagram is notice that, so on this side, we've got a significant interaction. And what we find with a significant interaction is, is our lines, of, our gender lines have kind of crossed over. So typically, if lines cross over on a graph like this, that might indicate that the interaction is likely to be significant. It won't always be, but it's, a, it's a, you know, a reasonably good visual guide. If, however, your lines are parallel to each other, that basically means there is almost certainly not going to be a significant interaction. Because of the, the nature of what the interaction is, it's, it's testing whether you know, the, basically the gap between the lines here is the same as the gap between the lines there. So if the lines are parallel, it means the gaps are not really changing. OK, let's uh, have a look at a different example. I don't know, uh, this, this, the music stops working normally when I do the, the penny thing. But you know what? It's probably a good thing because this was a clip of Robbie Williams, which you know, I put in just because this is an example about Robbie Williams. But if I'm honest, I don't really want to hear it because um, it's week 10. We're all emotionally vulnerable. That's the last thing we need. So this is an example about, because um, I... I um, well, it's not, you know, I don't know Robbie Williams. It could, be, it could be a lovely guy, I'm sure. But I find him quite irritating, if I'm honest. And there's not that many people I find irritating. In general, I try not to be irritated by people. But uh, Robbie Williams does uh, definitely push my buttons in certain kinds of ways. So um, in my fantasy world, where uh, basically everyone is a clone of me, uh, everyone would dislike Robbie Williams. That's clearly not the case, because, you know, he sells out stadiums to adoring fans. So um, I, I, yeah, I suspect I may be in a minority. But I wanted to test whether attitudes to Robbie Williams were uh, you know, negative or not. So I came up with this study. It's a priming study. I just took, took a paradigm from social psychology. And what I was going to do is I was going to prime nice or nasty personality characteristics. So some nice and nasty personality characteristics are going to pop up on a screen but I'm going to present them really rapidly. So they're sort of subliminal. So you, you have to try really hard to detect them. So my question is, what happens if you prime these nasty characteristics with different pictures? So I decided to use Robbie Williams. So the idea is that if you uh, put up a picture of Robbie Williams, if you like Robbie Williams, and then a nice characteristic appears on the screen, you should be better able to spot that characteristic because seeing Robbie has put you in a kind of nice... You know, it's activated your nice person schema, and therefore when you see the nice characteristic, you can attend to it much more rapidly and, and actually spot it before it disappears. Um, so I had a group of people who just saw pictures of Robbie Williams priming nice personality characteristics, and they just had to recognise these very rapidly presented words. Then I had a different condition where I still pictures of Robbie Williams, but it was priming nasty personality characteristics. So the idea is, you know, if you, if you don't like Robbie Williams, then that will activate your nasty person schema, and so you'll be better at detecting these uh, nasty characteristics. Now, I needed a control um, for Robbie Williams, and I thought the best control would probably be Ed Gein, who was uh, an American serial killer. And 
for if if you've ever watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that's loose, uh, loosely based on the story of Ed Gein. He was uh, uh, a strange chap, it would be fair to say, who uh, was. I mean, you know, there's lots of serial killers, but his his particular thing was peeling the skin of his victims and making like you know dresses out of them and dancing around his kitchen and stuff. Nice, nice guy to have as a neighbour. Um, so the thing is, I, why I thought this was a good control is, I said Robbie Williams used to have a video, uh, I think it might be for Rock DJ, I'm not sure, anyway, he's prancing around, and he sort of, he peels his own skin off and starts throwing it around. So I thought, well, you know, it's a good control for sort of skin peeling if I use Ed Gein, the serial killer. Uh, also, you know, Ed Gein, you would kind of universally expect everyone to uh, think he was nasty because he was a psycho. Anyway, so everyone saw 30 trials effectively, so 30 target words that they had to try to recognise. And there were seven people in each condition. So what are the variables I've got here? Well, one of my variables is going to be the type of prime. So whether people saw pictures of Robbie or pictures of Ed Gein. I'm going to have an independent variable which is the target. So this is the, the word that they had to recognise. So for some people they were nice words, for some oh, nice personality characteristics. And for other people, they were nasty personality characteristics. And my outcome is simply, how many of the 30 words could they actually detect? Because remember, I'm presenting them really, really rapidly. So let's have an example of a trial. So what they would see is a fixation cross to fixate their uh, attention on the middle of the screen. And they then see a picture. So this is a picture of Ed Gein. And um, then after, so this would be sort of displayed on the screen for a relatively short period of time. And then there'd be a rapidly presented word that would then be masked to make it difficult to see. So, watching? Did anyone see the word? No. We'll do it in slow motion. So, fixation cross, picture of Ed Gein, then sort of time vortex and slows everything down. Generous. And then it gets masked. So the question will be, on this trial, could the person say the word was generous? And like I say, the idea will be if, if you... If Ed Gein has activated a nice person schema, it will be relatively easy for you to detect uh, generous than if that hadn't happened. So let's have a go at another trial. Uh, here's another picture of Ed Gein. Slow motion again, so this will be a nasty characteristic. Selfish. So again, the question is, can you recognise this characteristic? So let's try a Robbie trial. So you fixated. Robbie flashes up on the screen. Anyone spot the word? No Robbie fans in here then. So that would be slow motion again, egotistic. <laughs> and you might have another trial with Robbie. <laughs> Picture flashed up on the screen. <laughs> Maybe another trial with Robbie. <laughs> anyway, so you get data a bit like this. So again, four groups of people, different people in each condition. So some of them saw Robbie uh, priming nice traits. Some of them saw Robbie priming nasty traits. Some saw Ed priming nice traits, some saw Ed priming nasty traits. And these are how many words out of 30 uh, they managed to recognise. So, again, we get uh, a similar table to the one we had before. So we've got three effects, an effect of prime, an effect of target, and the interaction. So we're uh, looking at... I've, I've, lost me. I've lost my ability to uh, point at stuff on the screen. I'll point it at this. So we've got p-value of uh, 0.024 for prime, so that's less than 0.05, so it's significant. For target, we've got a significant effect because 0.013 is less than 0.05, and for the interaction, that is also significant because 0.032 is less than 0.05. And here are some means, but I'm going to put them on a graph in a minute. So we've got a main effect of prime. So this is when we ignore whether it was a nice or nasty personality characteristic how many words did people recognise? And you can see from this that, uh, that I mean, it was a significant effect because the p-value was less than 0.05. But uh, we can see basically that Robbie up here, the mean is higher than Ed. So people, when we ignore which type of characteristics they were looking at, people recognised more words when they were primed with Robbie Williams than when they were primed with Ed Gee. But like I say, in a way, because there's a significant interaction, we don't, we're not really interested in interpreting this because we know that this, this bar here is made up of both conditions, the conditions that had nice characteristics and nasty. So this is a sort of mishmash of stuff. 
And uh, so, you know, in, in its own right, it's not that interesting. The main effect of target was also significant. So this is nice characteristics over here, nasty characteristics over there. So again, this is telling us if we ignore whether Robbie or Ed was used, do people recognize more nasty characteristics than nice? And the answer is yes. They recognize significantly more nasty characteristics than nice ones. But again, this isn't particularly interesting because we know that this mean here is made up of the conditions that had Ed and the conditions that had Robbie. So, you know, there's, again, a mishmash of stuff within this sort of bar. So what we're really interested in is this interaction, the prime by target interaction. Does anyone want to have a go at interpreting this effect? So what you need to think about is what, uh, well, one thing you can think about is what's the effect of the different characteristics for each of the primes. That would be one way to tackle it. I didn't bring any chocolate today. It's an error. Yeah, fantastic. So for Robbie, we get this big difference where they recognise more nasty characteristics than nice characteristics. Now, what's, what's going on for Ed? Anything? Difference? No difference. So there's kind of no difference for Ed Gein between the, the number of uh, nice and nasty characteristics recognised, but there is a big difference for Robbie. So when, when Robbie's being shown people are recognising more nasty characteristics. Now, you know, the psychological implication of this is that they uh, hate... Robbie is a more hateful character than Ed Gein, the skin-peeling serial killer. Like I said, data from a fantasy world that only I uh, occupy, probably. Um, the other way you could look at this is to look at uh, what's the effect of nice characteristics. And the effect is the same for Ed Gein and Robbie Williams. The line's flat. And what's the effect of nasty characteristics? Well, it changes depending on who's priming it. So you get more recognised for Robbie than you do for Ed. So you can look at it both ways. You can either look at kind of the, the effect of characteristic at each level of uh, you know, uh, prime, or you can look at the difference in the primes for each level of nasty characteristic. This is uh, just showing the same data as a bar chart, again, just because I want to get used to the idea that you might see these interactions as bars rather than uh, lines. And again, this shows a very clear picture in that in all these conditions, you get about, uh, well, it's about 10 out of 30 of the words recognised. So about a third of the words are recognised in every condition apart from one. And that one condition is Robbie priming the nasty characteristics. So on balance, across lots of... Uh, all, pretty much all the conditions, people recognise about one in three words, apart from when it's Robbie priming a nasty characteristic, they suddenly uh, can recognise more. About half, in fact. So, just by a show of hands, uh, without any other information, who reckons that that would be a significant interaction? Two people, three, four? More? Confidence is growing. Okay, quite a few of you. That's very good. That would, because the lines are not parallel, that would be, I, I don't guarantee it, but it's likely to be a uh, significant interaction because there's a different pattern going on for the, well, the blues are males than there are for the reds who are females. What about this one? Who thinks this is a significant interaction? Lots of shaking of heads. Very good. Because the lines are parallel, it means the difference between men and women or the difference between the lines is basically the same for the three alcohol conditions. Let's have a look at some bars. Significant interaction? Hands up. No. All right, there's a few no's. That's good. Uh, this would be no interaction because, again, the, uh, the pattern across the bars is pretty much the same. So here's males down here, females here. And the pattern of uh, like the, basically the difference between the bar heights is pretty similar in the men and women. So basically, this pattern over here kind of looks the same as that pattern over there. If you look at like the relative heights of the bars on the left, 
they're pretty similar to the relative heights of the vials on the right. What about this one? I'll give you a clue. We've seen this before earlier on in the lecture. <laughs> this, again, will be a significant interaction. So we've got like no difference between the bars really uh, here, but then there suddenly becomes a difference there. So the main thing to take home from this is really about trying to, trying to interpret interactions. And we will we'll come back to this next week when we do repeated measures designs, when we do three-way and over in the final week, we'll also come back to interactions. So you'll be getting lots of practice at it. But um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the main thing to bear in mind.